<clears throat> okay, guys. You like that light that's coming? Where's that coming from? Hmm. All right. It's a nice light, right? Almost looks like it's heavenly. What's going on? How you doing? Sorry, guys. I got caught up in the moment. I got live. Living is without you. Pray for the internet connection. <clears throat> Pray there's no buffering by the grace of God. You said, Anna said, I replied, Christians are synchronized with the body of Christ. We are clothed with, with circumcised. Please correct me. But who got, Anna, you said you got bashed. I was attacked by violating. Who told you, who attacked you? I don't get it. Hey, what's up, Caldean? How are you? David Walker. I'm walking. Yes, indeed. I'm walking. Yeah. Anna. <clears throat> When a Muslim, pray for the internet connection, pray for the buffering, so it doesn't get bad. Hold on, let me just do this. Yeah, I'm sure. You can tell my man, my shoulders are narrow, dude. What's up, man? We got to get you in shape, bro. Listen, Anna, one thing I want to teach you Christians is how to respond to Muslims and respond in the most effective way by the grace of Jesus Christ. When a Muslim tells you, that we're in violation of the Abrahamic covenant because we don't circumcise our male sons on the eighth day. Either that Muslim is ignorant or that Muslim is deceptive. Do you know why, Anna? Now, folks, I want to use Anna's experience with a Muslim as a teaching lesson to teach you by the grace of God's spirit how to refute Muslim attacks on the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Muslim is assuming that they keep the Abrahamic covenant, right? Circumcision, right? They keep the circumcision commanded by Abraham. Anna, this is why you need to start reading our articles, rebuttals, and watching our sessions carefully. Do you know why? I already addressed this in my response to Adnan Rashid and in an article I wrote. Anna, there's not a single verse in the Quran that commands Muslims to get circumcised. Not a single command in the Quran. And I'm praying Muslims are listening so that by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, they'll have the courage to face me and debate me. Here's the article I wrote. I want people who are listening. He, I'm going to post this article in the description. But for those of you listening now, save this link. <clears throat> Save this link. Save this link in Jesus' name. May the internet connection stay strong. Please, Lord Jesus, bless the session. Fill us with your spirit. I'll pray in a minute. There's not a single command in the entire Quran that tells Muslims they must circumcise their male sons on the eighth day. That's number one. Okay? Save this link. I just posted it twice. I'll post it a third time. Number two, the hadiths that they will quote, the narrations attributed to Muhammad, that they will quote, right? To justify circumcising are the same hadiths that say that women should be circumcised as well. What we call female genital mutilation. So now they're stuck. If they go to the hadiths to try to prove they go to the Hadiths to try to prove, right, that Muslims are to get circumcised. Those same Hadiths say it's males and females <clears throat> that need to be circumcised. You must circumcise the female, what we call female genital mutilation, an abomination, a horrendous, abominable procedure. I don't know what FGM means. Uh, so I don't know what FGM means. So they can't have their kick in either two. If they're going to go to the Hadiths, if they're going to the Hadiths, then they're stuck with the fact that those Hadiths say females get circumcised, which is an inhumane procedure to do to young girls. So they can't have their cake and eat it too. You go to the Hadiths, you destroy Islam, you bury Islam, you destroy Muhammad and expose him, as the Antichrist that he is. 
Oh, that's what it was. I'm sorry. So they can have their cake and eat it too. And this is all in my article. I just posted a link a fourth time. The title of the article is Open Challenge to Muslims. Show us where the Quran mentions circumcision. It doesn't. So nowhere does the Quran say you must keep this command that was part of the Abrahamic covenant because they are not truly sons of Abraham. Okay. You go to the Hadith. Number one, the Hadith do not say that you must circumcise males eight days old. doesn't even state that. And those same Hadiths say you circumcise males and females. So you end up proving too much, and you prove that Muhammad is an antichrist, a son of Satan. Stephen Anders, Universe, why are you, brother, I love you, why are you chiming in an argument that has nothing to do with the point she's making? They're attacking her on the grounds that we Christians are violating the Abrahamic covenant on the basis of Paul. Now, if you're going to play the role of a Mohammedan, then Stephen, I'm going to now treat you as a Mohammedan and tell you what I'll do to that argument. Sam, their argument is that Jesus was circumcised. So you want to play the role of Mohammedan? You want to pretend to be Zachariah? So I can show you what I would do to Zachariah? And I'll do it to you? You'll be his proxy? Right? I can do that. You interested, Steve? My man? My brother? My brother from a different mother, like no other? I can show that. So, okay. But my brother, I, I appreciate you, man. I really do. I'm glad. Even though I'm answering Anna, you wanted to chime in with your experience with Muslims. That's fine. I'll address it. You know I love you, bro. I love you enough to bash you like I bash everyone because I bash everyone whom I love. Okay. Do you want me to answer Because you're so excited. You brought it up. Because now I'm going to show you what I'll do to a Muslim who uses Jesus as an example. Okay. You ready for it or no? Okay. What do they hope to accomplish by saying that Jesus is circumcised? Are they saying that Christians have to get circumcised because Jesus did? Or they're saying that they're closer to Jesus. They follow Jesus more closely because they get circumcised. What are they saying? What are they saying? Because I want to know what angle are they approaching it from? You sure it's a thing that you said you heard them? Okay, if they say you are not like Jesus, right? Because Jesus got circumcised. Well, both the Bible and the Quran affirm not everything Jesus did applies to us. Because Jesus came to make lawful things that were unlawful for the Jews to, to do. Please, Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we beg you, bless the strength of the Internet connection. Keep it strong for your glory and guide this conversation. Anoint me to speak for the glory of Jesus with the passion from the Holy Spirit, with fire from the Holy Spirit, purging us and purifying us, cleansing us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. Okay. The Quran, in agreeing with the Bible, states... Just because Jesus did something doesn't mean it's applicable to those who come after him because Jesus also didn't get married. Which Muslim would say that's part of the sunnah of Christians not to get married? Right? But beyond that, chapter 3, verse 50 of the Quran, Stephen Universe says, Jesus confirmed the Torah between his hands, the Torah that he had access to, and made lawful things that were unlawful. Things that were prohibited and forbidden for the Jews to do, Jesus gave them permission to do it. Chapter 3, verse 50 of the Quran. I don't know if Protestant is here, first, last, if they're here. I don't know if you guys can hear me. It's like everyone's saying, okay. Chapter 3, verse 50. Thank you, guys. Thank the admins for helping me to help you for the glory of Jesus, and I have to pray. as the Spirit to fill us. And I come confirming that which was before me of the Torah, and make lawful some of that which was forbidden unto you. I come unto you with a sign from your Lord, so keep your duty to Allah and obey me. So did you catch it? The Quran is in agreement with the New Testament teaching in this regard. It is Jesus who tells us what is lawful and what is unlawful. It is Jesus who tells us what we can and cannot do, because the Quran says that Jesus came to make things lawful that were previously prohibited he made halal what was haram that's the arabic words so the quran doesn't say that jesus simply commanded his followers to follow every part of the torah 
The Quran says that Jesus came to command his followers to follow him, to obey him, to do what he commands, to do what he tells them to do. Are you with me there? Notice what is in 350. Okay, it says, fear Allah, keep your duty Allah, and obey me. So just because Jesus did something doesn't mean I'm bound to do it the way Jesus did it. I'm bound to do what Jesus tells me to do, and I'm free from the things that Jesus says he came to free me from. The Quran agrees, not because I believe the Quran. The Muslim believes in the Quran, so he's stuck with it, and that's the teaching of the New Testament. Okay, so if that's what they're trying to tell me, you're not following Jesus. Yes, I am. That's why I don't get circumcised. <clears throat> because Jesus, by his spirit, being poured out on his followers, filling his followers by his spirit, revealed through his apostles by the spirit indwelling them, the do's and don'ts for the Gentile church. And those do's and don'ts are preserved in the documents called the New Testament writings. Those are the writings produced by the Holy Spirit through the inspired emissaries of Jesus, whom Jesus spoke through by his spirit and commanded us through them by his spirit speaking in and through them to the church, telling the church what the church is supposed to do and what the church is free from. You want me there? And they can't object. Because I just gave you chapter 3, verse 50, Stephen. 350, don't forget it. Jesus came to make lawful those things that were unlawful. Halal, what was haram. And he says, keep your duty, Allah, fear Allah, and obey me. He didn't say obey the Torah. Obey me. And what I tell you to obey from the Torah, you keep. What I free you from, you're free. Now, the Muslim needs to then sit back and shut up and not bring this objection up ever again because he's going against his Quran. And I'm only quoting the Quran because he believes it, she believes it. I could care less what the Quran says. But from the Christian perspective, those who follow the New Testament, who follow Jesus, who love Jesus and trust in the Lord Jesus, we follow Jesus' interpretation, explication, exegesis, <clears throat> fulfillment of the law, and everything else that Jesus revealed by his spirit, which he sent to speak in and through the apostles and their followers. You want me there? Is that clear? Just want to make sure. If someone brings that up to you. Let me show you that from Jesus himself. Let me show you Jesus teaching people. And we pray in Jesus' name. We get more faces showing up. I forgot to send on a text message. Oh, my goodness. All right. Two of the people to come anyway. Let me show you. Let's go to Matthew 16. We're going to read 15 to 18. Matthew 16. Well, 15 to 19. Let's read 15 to 19. Because 19 is a key. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Matthew 16, 15, 19. Pay attention, 18, 19, specifically 19. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, Bariona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now pay attention. Right? And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee, you, Peter, thee, singular you, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Did you catch it? I'm giving you as the rock upon which I will build my church. And upon the foundation of the other apostles. Peter in union with the other apostles. Peter and the apostles and their companions are the rock, the spiritual foundation upon which the Lord Jesus will build his church in the power of the Holy Spirit. As the foundation of the church, Peter and the apostles and their companions will be guided by the Spirit, instructed by the Spirit, taught by the Spirit, what to say and what not to say, what commands to bind us to and what commands to free us from. The apostles and those who follow them, 
by the authority of the Holy Spirit, indwelling them and teaching them and instructing them, will bind Christians to certain commands and loosen Christians from certain commands. That's what binding and loosening means, bind and loose. Peter, by the Holy Spirit, telling him, instructing him, guiding him, sealing him, <clears throat> and granting him wisdom, will say to the church, you're bound to do this, you're loose from this. You're loose from that, you're bound to that. Jesus said that in Matthew. And he didn't just give this authority to Peter. He gave it to the church built by the apostles and the prophets and their companions as they were taught, instructed, guided by the Holy Spirit. Let me show you. Let's go now to Matthew 18, 17, 18. So, so far, are you with me? Thank you, Chaldean Assyrian. Keep praying that you learn more from me as the Holy Spirit keeps filling you with the wisdom and knowledge and understanding into the scriptures. And pray for all of us, Chaldean, that the Holy Spirit will give us greater love, faith, and trust in Jesus, to love Jesus more, to trust in him more, to hope in him more, live for him more perfectly and powerfully, and even die for Jesus in Jesus' name. So keep praying, Chaldean. Pray for the provision so I can do this for the glory of Jesus. Protestant, for some reason, these past two weeks, has been really dropping the ball. He imagines that I say verses that never come out of my mouth. I think Protestant, old age is kicking in, and you're starting to get the symptoms of amnesia. Only in a world in which the sky is red, would you think that Matthew 18, 17 to 18 is Matthew 17, 18. Protestant, what color is the sky in your world? Matthew 18, 17, 18. Don't you love it how I give my admins a hard time? That tells you I'm an equal opportunist offender. The guy doesn't get paid. He does it because he loves Jesus, and he loves us for the sake of Jesus, and I keep giving him a hard time. It's not easy working for me, man. May God have mercy and, and be patient with all of us, especially me in Jesus' name. But Matthew 18, 17 to 18. Again, Chaldean, everyone pay attention to this. And if he shall neglect to hear them, Tell it unto the church. But if you neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen. Consider him as an unbeliever, a heathen, and a publican, a tax collector, which was the worst position for a Jew to have at that time because the Jews considered you working for the enemy, working for the government that opposes the Jews. But then notice 18, the promise that our Lord Jesus gave to Peter. He extends it to the body of believers the foundation of which are the apostles and the prophets working together by the Holy Spirit, empowering them and teaching them what to say to the churches. I'm going to sound like a broken record. Let it sink in by the power of the Holy Spirit. So you understand what these passages are saying. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Understand by the power from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as the Holy Blood of Jesus Christ washes us, purifies us, and cleanses us. And the Holy Spirit refines us. And bless this session so I can speak truth without error. Anoint me to recall the passages and bless you with wisdom and knowledge from the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, washed, purified in the blood of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus, and bless the internet connection. Bless this session. Give us boldness and passion. Rebuke Satan. Crush his head under your feet, Lord Jesus, and save us from the evil one. And my daughters as well, in Jesus' name. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. Matthew 18, 18. Notice again what it says to the church. To the church. Let it sink in. Okay, verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye, notice ye, he's talking to the disciples whom he'll send out in the power of the Holy Spirit to be the foundation of the church. What ye, you, listening to me, whom I will send, send out to build my church, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So notice what the Lord Jesus said. The disciples will do. You'll be sent out. As my inspired emissaries, you will be the foundation of my church, bringing people to saving faith by the spirit, forming them into my spiritual body, becoming the spiritual body of Christ. And you will instruct the church and tell them what they're supposed to do and what they're free from. You will bind them to certain things and loose them from other things. You're getting it? Yep, and Acts 15 is an example of the binding and loosening or loosing Jonathan Simon. Because in Acts 15 in the Jerusalem Council, they exercised the authority given to them by Jesus in Acts 15 when they were deciding the issue of Gentiles. Do Gentiles need to keep the law of Moses to be saved? 
The answer, absolutely not. They're saved because of Jesus, because of his grace, and that salvation is given to them as a gift when they believe in Jesus, trust in Jesus, and here's what the Gentiles are supposed to do, and here's what they're freed from. So the Jerusalem Council freed Gentiles, loose Gentiles from getting circumcised, having to keep the dietary prohibitions outlined in Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, except the following com commands which they bound them to. They bound them to no meat sacrificed idols that were strangled, killed in a humane way, right, <clears throat> with the blood in it, and refrained from sexual immorality. That shows you they're exercising the authority that Christ gave them to bind and loose. They bound them to those commands and loose them from these other commands, right? <clears throat> Did you get it? Yeah, hit that like button. And we should be having 200. I'm not even, I don't even have 100. I'm about to cry. Now, how did they make those decisions? Did they make those decisions? Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue. Holy Spirit, take over, please, for the glory of Jesus. Did they make those decisions on their own whim? Let's go to Acts 15, 28 to 29. Acts 15, 28 to 29. Did they come up with those decisions on their own? Acts 15, 28 to 29. Watch here. Now they're writing a letter to the churches with the authorization of the apostles and elders. Now notice what they say in the letter to the churches. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. So we didn't come up with these decisions on our own. The Holy Spirit moved us and showed us this is good. This is what's preferable. This is what's better. This is what's good. Who? The Holy Spirit and us. Working with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit working through us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. That ye abstain from meats offered titles and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. You caught it? We don't just follow the law of Moses. We follow the Old Testament as interpreted by Jesus Christ, explained by Jesus Christ, completed by Jesus Christ, perfected, fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and the revelations that Jesus brought in addition to the Old Testament by the Holy Spirit, revealing those things in and through the apostles for the churches preserved in the Bible, specifically the New Testament. Right? God bless you too, basic. Right? Is it clear? Let's go to John 16, 12 to 13. John 16, 12 to 13. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How are you doing, Brother Michael? You can't bear them. You're not able to take in the things I want to share with you. So then what's going to happen, Jesus? Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. So notice what the Lord Jesus just said. You're not ready to handle the revelations that I want to share with you. You're not ready now. I will send the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. He will then empower you, enable you, illuminate you, so that you will then be able to take in these revelations and then pass them on. So the Holy Spirit will come. He won't tell you things on his own initiative. He will relate to you what he's hearing. Hearing from who? The Father and the Son. I will send the Spirit to communicate to you those commands, those instructions, that wisdom that the Father and I want you to know, want you to pass on, want you to believe, live, affirm, and proclaim. Do you see it? And the entire book of Acts is the record of how the Holy Spirit taught the apostles, right? Instructed the apostles, illuminated the apostles, empowered the apostles, and guided the apostles to evangelize, to convert, to teach, and to establish the church of Christ. You have a book of 28 chapters called the book of Acts. 
It's the book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit, which he wrought through the Holy Spirit, uh, through the Holy Apostles and Prophets. The book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit, which he carried out in and through the Holy Apostles and Prophets, in converting unbelievers, establishing the church, and teaching the church, and guiding the church into all truth. Right? You getting it? And let me show you Paul saying, he's teaching us wisdom taught to him by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.13. And he's instructing us on matters that Jesus didn't address while he was on earth. When Jesus was on earth, he didn't address these issues. But when he went to heaven, he sent the Spirit to then reveal to the apostles how to address questions and deal with situations that Jesus didn't address while he was on earth. 1 Corinthians 2.13. Which things also we speak, not the words which man's wisdom teacheth. We're not teaching you based on human wisdom. Our instruction doesn't come from human wisdom, human understanding. But which the Holy Ghost teacheth, which the Holy Spirit is teaching us. Wisdom from the Holy Spirit, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You see how Paul records the fulfillment of the promise of the Lord Jesus. The Spirit will guide you into all truth when I go. And Paul says, long after Jesus has left the earth physically, the wisdom I'm sharing with you, Christians, you at Corinth, that's the wisdom the Holy Spirit has taught me to teach you. Right? Is it sinking in? 2 Corinthians 13, verse 3 and 10. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 3 and 10. Now, I'm not going to make this the entire session, but I just wanted to answer the question. Are we following Jesus when we don't get circumcised and Jesus is circumcised? Was circumcised? Yes. Yes, we are. And that's this is the answer. 2 Corinthians 13, 3 and 10. Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, you want proof that Christ is speaking in me? I'll give you plenty of proof. The miracles that you saw me do, proof that it's not me speaking, it's Christ speaking through me. These instructions are Christ instructions. You see it? Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. Now notice 10. Therefore, I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification, not to destruction. So Jesus has authorized me, empowered me to rebuke, to instruct, to teach, to discipline. And the proof that Christ has given me such power, I'm doing miracles before your eyes as proof that it's Jesus who's speaking through me by his spirit. You caught it? Is it clear now? So you have 27 books of instruction called the New Testament, given by the Holy Spirit of the risen Jesus, whom the Holy Spirit revealed in and through the apostles and prophets, with the revelation from heaven upon which the church is built, Revelation that binds us to certain commands and things we must do and looses, loosens, looses us from certain things. So if that's clear, right? Is that clear to everybody? So I hope that's clear as the Holy Spirit loosens my tongue and guides this discussion for the glory of Jesus that saves me from error and blesses you with wisdom, illumination from his glorious presence and fills us with love for Jesus, passionate love for Jesus and holiness and purity and wash us in the blood of Jesus. Holy Spirit, please take over the session and transform me and everyone listening to conform to the image of Jesus Christ and save us from our calamities and our loved ones, my daughters, seal them by your glorious power and presence and wash them and wash us in the blood of the Lord Jesus and please open doors of blessings that no man can shut in Jesus' name. I hope that was clear. Everyone understood. And I hope uh, my buddy, Sa uh, Stephen Universe, I was going to call him Samurai for some reason. Stephen Universe, I hope that was clear. You got your answer when they bring that up? You refute them from the Quran 
And then you go back to the New Testament and show them. Now, I can stay here and expound on this, but I think I've given you enough proof that it's not simply following what Jesus said on earth. It's following all that Jesus revealed while he was on earth and also from the throne in heaven when he sent the Spirit to indwell the apostles, to teach them and guide them, illuminate them with further revelations that the church has to now act upon, build on for the glory of Jesus. Right? I guess Protestant, you still here, my brother Protestant? Yes. Okay. What happened to our buddy first and the last? Is he now the last and waiting for someone else to be the first? <laughs> All righty then. I'm going to continue responding to the meme. Are we circumcised through clothing his own body? What do you mean? I don't know what you mean. Clothing his own body. What do you mean clothing his own body? I don't know what you mean. Clothing his own body. Maybe you need to rephrase that. There's a meme I started responding to last night, and I'll just continue. And Lord willing, I'll continue my sessions on 1 Corinthians 15, 28, God willing, on Jesus not being the Archangel Michael, on the deity of Christ and the synoptics. And I'll have to revisit some other issues. You know, I'll have to go also into the authority of Scripture, preservation of Scripture, God willing, salvation, and other topics and objections as they arise. If Jesus is pleased to use me by his Spirit for his glory, in Jesus' name, because the Lord doesn't need me. He really doesn't. I really need him, and I really do. Without him, I can't do it. I'm a human being who's imperfect and sinful, who struggles with his own imperfections and sins, and struggles with the imperfections and sins of others, and the trials of Satan and of corrupt evil men and women. And I endure by the life that the Holy Spirit gives me, with the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing me and shielding me, so that I never fail him. And may the blood of Jesus cleanse all of us and shield us and our loved ones, especially my two angels, whom I miss and love and adore. Lord Jesus, love them. Okay, I'm looking for the meme so we can continue. Okay, you guys ready? I'm going to find the meme. This is a meme on a Muslim Facebook page, a meme that tries to pit the Bible against church teaching. Now, again, for the record, I'm going to have to be honest because one thing I don't want to be, pray the Lord Jesus empowers me never to be a crowd pleaser, never to compromise, never to prostitute myself for the love of men or for money. Be a man of integrity, but at the same time, not be unnecessarily offensive, that even when we disagree, uh, discuss disagreements, if they are not crucial, if they are secondary issues that do not affect salvation, I can air out the disagreements lovingly and charitably with patience from Jesus Christ. One thing I don't want to do, I don't want to tickle ears in Jesus' name. Father, Holy Spirit, bless the internet connection. In Jesus' name, please, my God, Father, Son, Spirit. One thing I do not want to do, I don't want to tickle ears. I don't want to be a crowd pleaser for love or fortune or fame, but I don't want to be unnecessarily offensive. Let's go to Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. What Paul says <clears throat> the responsibility of servants of Christ happens to be. If you are a servant of Christ and you're seeking to glorify Jesus Christ and you're not seeking to gain the love of men, notice what he says. Galatians 1, 2, for do I now persuade men or God? Am I here to please men? Persuade means do I, am I here to please men, to make men happy? Or am I here to please God? Or do I seek to please men? For if, he, if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So notice what he's saying. If you're going to go doing ministry to please men, you will not be able to please Jesus Christ and be a true servant of Christ because you're going to have to compromise to make men happy because there are things that Jesus stands for that the world hates. So that's why you have so many churches now watering down the gospel and saying it's okay to be homosexual as long as it's in a monogamous homosexual relationship devoted to Jesus. It's okay to be a lesbian. It's okay if you think that you're not really the gender that you are created in. So they're capitulating. They're capitulating to conform to the world and appease the world, and in so doing, shaming Jesus, shaming the gospel, and perverting scripture. 
And that's what Paul is saying. If I'm here to please men and persuade men, I cannot be a true servant of Christ. Because being a servant of Christ means I'm his ambassador to speak his words with integrity and honesty, without compromise, without fear or shame. And yet Jesus has things to say that the world cannot receive, cannot stand, but hates because the world is demonized under the influence of Satan. Right? So etch this in your heart and your mind. You are servants of the living God, Father, Son, and Spirit. You are servants of the risen Lord of glory, Jesus Christ. You need to make sure he's happy. You make him happy first and foremost. And let the Holy Spirit worry about the reaction of those hearing the truth. Because notice what Paul says in Galatians 4, 16. Galatians 4, 16. Galatians 4, 16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? See what he's saying? He's talking to Christians that he led to faith who are now questioning whether Paul told them the truth. He goes, now that I have to correct you, now that I have to reprimand you, now that I have to discipline you because you're being deceived by false Christians, false brethren preaching a false gospel, and now I got to use my authority to correct you and shame you and discipline you. Now do you hate me because I'm speaking the truth? When I came to you with the truth and you saw that it was the truth, you loved me. But now someone has deceived you, misled you into thinking, maybe I wasn't speaking the truth. And so now do you hate me for having to chasten, rebuke you, remind you that the truth I preach, that's the truth of God, not what you're falling for now? See what he's saying? You see his point? So what's the point? I'm not here to be unnecessarily offensive and to hurt your feelings. That's not what I want to do. But I can't be a crowd pleaser. So I'm not going to make everyone happy. As long as I can express our differences in a spirit of love, on those issues where we can agree to disagree, please bear with me if you disagree with me. But if it's an issue related to the very heart of the Christian faith, core doctrines, there, I cannot agree to disagree with you. I have to come out and say, this is wrong. And if you don't repent, you can go to hell for it. And if I'm wrong about it, may the Spirit convict me to realize my error and repent and save us from error and guide us in all truth and give us the power to live the truth and love the truth for the glory of Jesus. Okay. I brought this up because this meme is making a distinction between what the Bible teaches and the church. The impression of the meme is the impression of the meme is that the Trinity is a doctrine of the church contradicted by the words of Jesus in the Bible. So let me get you the meme because I began part one of my response last night. It's archived, so you can go listen to it. Now, with that said, it is true. It is true. There are traditions in various churches, and it's not just Orthodox or Coptic or Catholic or Nestorian, even Protestant denominations. We all have traditions. Tradition is not bad. There are good traditions, inspired traditions. And there are traditions that are not contradicted by the Bible. But there are traditions that do contradict the Bible and early history. Some of those traditions, though they contradict the Bible, they don't contradict it in such a way where it's damnable. But there are some traditions that do contradict the Bible in those areas that can damn you to hell if you don't repent of them. It's simply a fact. And those of you here are proof. Some of you are Orthodox, but you're not Roman Catholic because you believe that Orthodox has maintained greater purity and fidelity to the pure apostolic teaching than the Roman Catholics. But then there are Roman Catholics who believe that about the Catholic Church and think that though the Orthodox Church is apostolic in origin, it is not as pure or hasn't maintained the purity of the apostolic faith or understood the apostolic deposit as clearly as the Roman Catholic Church. And then that's the same with the Coptics and the Nestorians. In other words, the very fact that some of you belong to one domination and not another, you are proof that you're agreeing with what I'm saying that you see not all traditions are right and not all churches have the correct traditions. 
This is why if I criticize the Roman Catholic tradition that the Orthodox don't accept, amen, brother, praise the Lord, we're with you. But then when I criticize a doctrine held uniquely by the Orthodox, they get upset. They're no longer hallelujahing or amening me, but the Catholic preach. You get my point? Because you will not be able to satisfy and please every human being. Nor should you. You want to please, delight, make happy the heart of God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Make him happy first and foremost. All right? One second. One second, guys. Let me see something. Okay, sorry. She wants to use economy. Okay. So there is some truth in the meme. Okay. Some truth in the meme. I haven't even been able to go to the gym regularly. I'm trying to get settled in my new home. God willing, when I'm settled, I will then take it to the next level, more intense physical training of God is pleased to achieve my goals for his glory in Jesus' name. But anyway, there is some truth in the meme. There are traditions in the church that are not taught in scripture that are contradicted in Scripture. And some of these teachings contradict the Scripture in, in such a way they're not damnable, but in certain areas they are, okay? And I'll try to give you an example what I mean by a teaching that contradicts the Scripture, but it's not a tradition that contradicts in such a way that will damn you, right? And again, I'm trusting the Spirit to guide me, to speak clearly, to bless you and save me from error. And may he purify our motives and the holy blood of Jesus to never be crowd pleasers. Never. Never be crowd pleasers. Here is the link. Okay. Hold on. Let's get it. Let me just get the link. Here it is. Here is our boy, a Muslim trying to use the words of Jesus to prove Islam. Okay, with that said, are we ready to rock and roll? This is now the second part, part two. Thank you, Sai Christian. You're such a hater, bro. This is part two. I began part one last night. Okay, now, we were discussing John 20, 17. If you did not hear, hear the first session, you need to go back and listen to it so that what I'm about to say will make better sense. So if you're not following me, that's okay. When you hear the first session, everything will make sense by the grace of God's spirit. Now, if you look at the meme, I discussed John 20, verse 17. So let's finish the discussion. Every single passage mentioned in this meme, I've already addressed in previous sessions on YouTube, in previous shows, elsewhere. There's even a video clip that David Wood recorded in ABN Studios. I think it's about 13 minutes where I go in-depth on John 14, 28, the Father is greater than I. I've written lengthy articles and responses to all of these passages on the website I write for, answeringislam.net, answeringislam.net, and on my blog, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com answeringislamblog.wordpress.com holy spirit guide my my tongue in jesus name answeringislamblog.wordpress.com man say that five times fast but again we're creatures of repetition we need to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature by the grace of god's spirit so let's deal with this john 2017 the point of this passage is to show Jesus can't be the only son of God. Why can't he be? Because the same Bible, John 20, verse 17, plainly states that Jesus' father is the father of all disciples. All of his disciples who believe in him and the Lord Jesus, they too have God as their father. They too are the children of God. So how can you say Jesus is the only son? I began discussing this yet last night, and I showed how this passage proves Muhammad is an antichrist, a false prophet. Because Muhammad said his God, Allah, is not the father of Jesus, and he's not the father of Christians. So since the Muslim quoted this verse, it ends up proving too much. It proves that Muhammad is a false prophet because he contradicts this verse. Thank you, Muslim, 
for proving to us Muhammad is an antichrist according to the very verse that you cited from John's gospel, which you say happens to be the words of the Lord Jesus. Bye-bye, Muhammad. But for the rest of you, let's explain what it means for Jesus to be the only son of God when God has many sons. He has many sons and daughters. And in previous sessions, I went in-depth on the term son of God in my series on angels. Right? There's a series I did on serpent seed theory and the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6, verses 2 to 4. I went in-depth on the various nuanced shades of meaning found in the Bible in regards to the term son of God or in respect to God being the father. Right? Go back, review those sessions, look up the passages until you absorb the information. Become second nature, and you can teach others by the grace of God's Spirit. Okay, let's explain what it means here. As we saw last night in John 1, 12 to 13, believers in Jesus Christ are given the grace of becoming children of God because of the Lord Jesus. In other words, it's what Jesus did for us in his perfect, righteous, obedient life, his perfect life, of obedience and his death on the cross for our sins that gives us the right that has merited for us the right to share in the sonship of Christ. So we become children of God because of grace, by grace. Whereas Jesus is God's son by nature, by his very nature and essence, he is the essential, the true spiritual offspring of God. Whereas we are children of God by grace. By adoption. Okay, everyone with me there so far? Because I want to unpack this point. Okay. And I noted yesterday that when John calls believers sons of God, he uses a different term when he speaks of Jesus as the son of God. When John wants to describe believers in Christ as sons of God, he calls them techna. Tekna, I believe plural of tekna. Tekna, theu. Tekna, theu. That's John 1.12. Let's look at it. John 1.12, I'm going to give you the Greek. Tekna, theu. Now, those of you who know Greek, you have an advantage and a blessing because you can read these verses in Greek and see the difference. Right? Tekna, theu. Here it goes. I'm going to give you Biblehub.com, the Greek interlinear of John. So you can see it for yourself, okay? Here it goes. Jesus' name as he blesses the internet connection. Please, my God. Tekna theu. It's right there. Look at it. Jesus gave them the right to be called, to be tekna theu, to become. It's tekna theu. Guinness die. Guinness die. To become. Children of God, they became. To become. Tekna theu genestai. Now again, I'm raspian pronunciation. A native Greek speaker would laugh at that pronunciation. That's fine. Now when John calls Jesus the son of God, he doesn't use that word. He uses weus. Weus. Weus, right? So even the language used, to describe believers' relationship to God as his sons is different from the language that John uses to speak of Jesus' sonship. Jesus is called weus, you know, theu, the son of God, weus, that word weus, or some would say weas, okay? Whereas when it comes to believers, he doesn't use that word, he uses tekna. So even the Greek words that he uses, and this is only true of John, even the Greek words that John uses to describe the sonship of Christ and the sonship of believers in general, he uses different words and he uses different language. Jesus is weos or weus theu, the son of God. Believers are tekna theu. He uses the word tekna. Tekna theu. He uses the word tekna. M.M., you're here, sister? Good. 
Here, now let me show you that. Here's the link again. Look, because they, they provide the Greek and English transliteration. You don't need to read Greek. You'll see it says tekna theou, right? Now let me show you the word for Jesus. What is Jesus called? John 3, 16. Let's go there and see. Is he called, is the word tekna used or is the word weos or weus used? Let's see. Here's John 3, 16. John 3, 16. Here you go. I thought that's MM. I guess not. There's the Greek link. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The word only begotten son appears in verse 18 as well. Click on that link of Greek. What's the word for son? Here it is. Hoste, that. Ton, weyun, or weyan. There's that word, accusative. Ton, weyan, or weyun. Ton, monogene. Ton, weyan, ton, monogene. Ton, weyun, ton, monogene. Trying to pronounce like the Greek word. You see, it's the word weos, weus, weos, weus. Everyone see it? Do you understand, especially you, those of you who read Greek? Do you see the Greek words used to describe believers' relationship to God as his sons? And the words used to describe Jesus' relationship to God as a son, they're different. They're not the same. Did you get it? Let me show you now in, in John's epistle. The first epistle of John. 1 John 3, verse 1. 1 John 3, verse 1. Here's the Greek, and I'll post it for us. 1 John 3, verse 1. Let me know if I'm boring you guys with this stuff. I pray in Jesus' name we get more viewers, not less, that are really interested in learning. I really hope this stuff doesn't bore you, man. Really. I torture myself hearing myself speak. Okay? All right. All right. 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. What love God the Father has given us, that we should be called sons of God. Look at that link. The word sons of God, it's hinna tekna theyu. Kleithomen. Hinna tekna theyu. Kleithomen. Kleitho means we should be called. Notice it's the word tekna again. Do you guys see it? It's the word tekna again. Everyone got it? Before I move on? What about 1 John 3.10? 1 John 3.10. 1 John 3.10. 3, Here's the Greek of 1 John 3.10. In this, the children of God are manifest. How do we know the children of God from the children of the devil? And the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Okay, what's the Greek words for children of God? What's the Greek word for children? There's the link for John 3, 1. Ta tekna tu theu. It's ta tekna, the children, tu theu, of the God. And the words in Greek for the children of the devil? Ta tekna tu diabolu. Ta tekna tu diabolu. So everyone got it? Even the words used to describe Jesus' sonship and the sonship enjoyed by believers in Christ, they're different. They're not even the same. So let's explain why he's called the only son. Now write these down. There is a word that John uses in the gospel and in the first epistle. The word is monogenes. I'll transliterate it for you. Monogenes. 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 Okay? It's, co it's composed of two words. Manos and genos. Two words. Manos and genos. Okay? This word, monogenes, appears five times 
in the Gospel of John and the first epistle of John in reference to Jesus. Jesus is called monogenes five times in the Gospel of John and the first epistle of John. Four times in John, John's Gospel, one time in 1 John. Here are the places, write them down. John 1, 14. John chapter 1, verse 14. John chapter 1, verse 18. John 1, 14. John 1, 18. John chapter 3, verse 16. John chapter 3, verse 18. Four times in the Gospel of John. John 1, 14. John 1, 18. John 3, 16. John 3, 18. And he uses it one other time in 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. Let's look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. First John chapter 4, verse 9. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because God, that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Now the King James and the New King James render the word monogenes as only begotten, and they'd be correct. So the term monogenes is only used of Jesus when speaking of God having sons, Jesus is the only son of God who said to be monogenes. No other son of God. There is no one else who's a son of God that's called monogenes. Though God has many sons and daughters, there's only one son called monogenes. God has only one son who is his monogenes. You understand the point I'm making? So when this Muslim meme says that Christians say, the church says Christ is the only son, and somehow, quote John 20, 17, refuted, that shows you the Muslim doesn't know the Bible, and I'm pretty certain he doesn't even know the Quran. Because this term, monogenes, the word monos there does mean only. The word manas, monos, that's the word one and only. He is called the one and only son. The word monogenes is used five times in John's inspired writings. The Gospel of John appears four times in the first epistle one time and only used of Jesus because there is no other child of God who's God's monogenes. Jesus and only Jesus is the monog monogenes, son of God. But that's not why he's called monogenes, Remy. You're trying hard again. Jesus is not called monogenes because he was born of a virgin. Don't make that mistake, please. Okay? If you're late, that's great. Just don't chime in. Make a point that's going to backfire against you. Okay? Now, did you understand? I want to make sure everyone got it before I move to the next point. Do you understand Jesus and Jesus alone is called God's mono, monogenes? No other son of God is called God's monogenes. Monogenes, son is used only in reference to Jesus. In fact, in John 1.14, it simply uses monogenes. It's monogeneos. It doesn't even supply the word son. It simply says he is the monogeneos. Monogeneos. Right? Now, monogenes is used... For Isaac to describe his relationship to Abraham. Did you know that Isaac is called Abraham's monogenes? So that term monogenes is used in another context in reference to another son, not of God, but the son of Abraham. Hebrews eleven seventeen. Hebrews eleven seventeen. I'm sorry. Yeah, Hebrews eleven seventeen. What's wrong with me? Why am I sorry? No, I'm not. I should tell you, my computer shuts down sometimes. Hebrews 11, 17. Here you go. He's going to quote it. Here's the Greek. 
Here's the Greek. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that received the promised offer offered up his only begotten son. By faith, as Holy Spirit loosens my tongue to glorify Christ. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Click on the Greek or the link to the Greek interlinear. There it is. I just gave it to you. The Greek says he offered up who? Tan monogene. Monogene. Tan monogene. Tan monogene. Did you know that the author of Hebrews doesn't even supply the Greek word for son, weus or weos? He simply says he offered up ton monogene. He offered up the monogenes. His monogenes. Okay, now let me ask you a question so you understand what it means for Jesus to be the only begotten son. What it means for Jesus to be the only begotten son. We know Isaac is not the only son of Abraham. In fact, he's the second son of Abraham, Ishmael being the first son of Abraham. And for at least 14 years, Ishmael was the only son. And we know that Abraham had eight sons altogether. In Genesis 25, if you read from verse 1, you can read 1 to 11. After the death of Sarah, Abraham married a woman named Keturah. And she gave birth to six other sons. So Abraham had eight sons from three different women. He had Ishmael from Hagar, Isaac from Sarah, and the six sons from Keturah. So at no point in time was Isaac ever literally the only begotten son of Abraham. Yep, Sai Christian, I thought you knew this, man. Ishmael, the son of Abraham from Hagar, Genesis 16. Isaac, the son of Abraham from Sarah, Genesis 21. Then Keturah, Genesis 25, after Sarah died, was buried, gave birth to six other sons for Abraham, one of whose names was Median, which will be important in the history of Moses and Israel. Median. So altogether, Abraham had eight sons. So at no point in time was Isaac ever the only begotten son. Hit that like button, folks. But he's called the only begotten son. Do you know why? Because the word isn't simply focusing on the fact that he's begotten by Abraham. The term manas, one and only, doesn't always mean the only one, but it can mean the only one of its kind. Literally, Isaac is the uniquely born son of Abraham. So monogenes in reference to Isaac doesn't mean he's the only child born to Abraham. It means he is the only begotten son of his kind. The word monos there is stressing uniqueness. He's the only one of his kind. Right? You're going to learn a lot today if you're focusing. So Isaac is monogenes, not that he's the only born son. He is the only son born to Abraham in the sense that there is no other son like him. He's unique. He is the uniquely born. The son born to Abraham who's unique, no other son being like him. Now, the question is, what makes him the one and only son of his kind, the one and only begotten son of his kind, that he's a begotten son that's unique and other sons like him, even though he had seven brothers? Deborah answered it. No, Alex. Ishmael is a son by nature. The six sons of Keturah are Abraham's sons by nature. That's not the answer. Deborah gave you the answer. What makes Isaac the one and only begotten son, the only son of his kind? Because Isaac is the only son that God promised to Abraham 
to be the heir of the covenant. He didn't give that promise to Ishmael, nor the six other sons. Isaac and Isaac alone was set apart by God's sovereign freedom to be the heir of the promises of the covenant giving to Abraham. So there was no other son like him because no other son was the heir of the covenant promises to Abraham. PJ, you're still not listening. Abraham had six other sons when he was even older and later than Isaac. Why do you come up with answers that you think are addressing the question when you're only destroying your argument and digging yourself in a hole, PJ? So was Abraham young when he had six other sons from Keturah after Sarah died and Isaac had already married? Come on, guys. Think more deeply, more critically. What has his old age got to do with anything? That means the other sons from Keturah are even more unique. You with me there? So why is he monogamous? Why is Isaac monogamous? He's the only begotten son of his kind. There are other sons, but there is no son like Isaac. So what makes him unique? Uniquely born, uniquely begotten. He is the only son that God chose to be the heir of the covenant promises given to Abraham. Ishmael wasn't included. The six other sons weren't included. Isaac and Isaac alone. Genesis 17, verses 15 to 21. Genesis 17, verses 15 to 21. Is that clear? And God sent Abraham as for Sarai, thy wife. Thou shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be, princess. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her, one son from her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. From her one son... Many nations will spring forth and many kings from that one son of Sarah, because Sarah had only one son. Okay, now read carefully. Verse 17, then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born unto him that is 100 years old? By the time Isaac is born, I'm going to be 100. And shall Sarah, that is 90 years old, bear? By the time she gives birth, she'll be 90. Oh, come on. Come on, God. And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Well, my son Ishmael is already 13 years old, God. Let him be the heir of the covenant. Choose him. You don't need to give me a son from Sarah. I already got one. It's Ishmael. Watch here. Okay. Verse 19. Notice what God says. 19 to 21. And God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed. Have no doubt. She's going to give birth to a son. Thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. You got it, Abraham? It's him and only him. The promises I gave to you will be extended to him. He's included, and your seed of the covenant will come through his line. You get it, Abraham? But now notice 20. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget. Right? <clears throat> and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. Could it be any clear why Isaac is the only begotten son? My promise to you includes Isaac. My covenant with you, blessings of the covenant, will extend to him and his seed. Your line will come through his seed. That seed will be the seed of the covenant. 
not Ishmael, not the six other sons. I'm going to bless them to make them great, but it's him alone. You with me there? Daily Greg, here's one of why you need to focus on the topic and not bring in issues that you may think is relevant because this is going to backfire against you. That assumes that the author of Hebrews is aware that the term monogenes is used of Jesus. Since since only John and John alone that uses the word monogenes, now the burden of proof is on you to show that the author of Hebrews also knew that Jesus is called monogenes and used that term for him. See what you just did? Because you want to be a chief, my brother, and not an Indian. Too many chiefs. It's not because I want to talk down to you guys. I'm trying to help you be sharp and to do the best you can for the glory of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. So now, Daily Great, pr prove to me that the author of Hebrews knew that Jesus is called monogenes and used that term to describe Jesus. Prove it. Give me proof that he knew that was a term used for Jesus. Come on, Daily Gripe. I'm waiting. Don't waste time. Is he here or is he gone? Did he take a vacation? Yeah, but that's what I'm saying, Daily Gripe. For your argument to work, you need to prove that the author of Hebrews would be aware that the term monogenes is used for Jesus when he never uses that term for Jesus, though he calls Jesus the Son, right? In order for him to be deliberately calling Isaac monogenes to present Isaac as a type of Christ. No, it's not buffering. It's actually doing good smooth on my end. I'm not saying you can't make the connection. But you didn't word it that way. You said it's a motif of Hebrews. How do you know it's a motif of Hebrews? Yeah, your mother would know about crackheads, Rug Rugburn. Right? You are right. We who are looking at the whole, whole canon of Scripture, we can make that connection and see the motif. But that's not what you said. You said it's a motif of Hebrews. Prove it's a motif of Hebrews that Isaac is called monogenes because he's connecting the monogenes to God's monogenes, Jesus, by showing that the author of Hebrews knows that's a term used for Jesus. You get my point? So let me explain. It's one thing to say that when I look at it, I can see the motif. And it is. Isaac is a picture of Jesus, no doubt about it. It's another thing to show that the author of Hebrews is aware of the connection with Isaac being monogenes and Jesus being monogenes. You guys with me? I'm trying to help you avoid pitfalls where unbelievers and skeptics will tell you, prove it. Prove that Hebrews is aware that Jesus is monogenes. Because the word monogenes is only used by John in reference to Jesus Christ. John is the only New Testament writer that calls Jesus monogenes. He does it in the Gospel of John four times and one time in his epistle, 1 John 4, verse 9. Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't call him monogenes. They call him agapitas, the beloved. And Paul calls him the beloved. Did you know that? In Ephesians 1, verse 6 and Colossians 1, 13... Paul calls Jesus the beloved. And Matthew, Mark, Luke call Jesus the beloved. So, since tradition says Hebrews was an epistle of Paul, and there's strong support that Hebrews was written by Luke on behalf of Paul, one can argue that Hebrews prefers the word agapitas, beloved, or the term beloved, in reference to Christ. You see the point what I'm trying to make? You understand daily? I'm trying to help you. As long as the Holy Spirit 
uses me to help the body to become the best possible evangelist and apologist for the glory of Christ. Lex Stefani, you actually work backwards, backwards because you speak from your buttocks and you sit on your face. It's a trait you learned from your mother. Don't you love it? I'm being so loving and kind. Where is the love? All right, everyone there? Is that clear? Did you get it, Daily Gripe? So yes, there is a connection to be made between Isaac and Jesus. And Hebrews eleven seventeen happens to be one of those connections. But that's not the same as saying that Hebrews is doing it deliberately because it's a motif in Hebrews to show Isaac is monogenes as a shadow of Jesus being the monogenes. Clear? Just want to make sure it's clear. Right? But stay focused on the point of monogenes. You're thinking about how to sign with Jesus, but did you understand now the meaning of monogenes? Because the issue is, why is Jesus monogenes? I just explained why Isaac is. Did everyone understand why Isaac is monogenes? Not only was he born uniquely, even his birth was miraculous, unlike Ishmael. Ishmael was just conceived out of the lack of patience of Sarai. And Abraham, not thinking twice of getting a woman pregnant. Right? Sure, Sarai didn't have to bend his arm to sleep with Hagar, her mistress, to get her pregnant. So there was nothing miraculous about his birth in that it was a natural conception. But Isaac's birth was miraculous because Abraham was 89 years old and Sarai had been barren up to that time. She, uh, Sorry, Abraham was 99 years old, as Holy Spirit corrects me, pr protects me from error. And Sarai was barren up to that time and she was 89 when she conceived Isaac, even though previously she couldn't get pregnant. So that means God did a miracle to invigorate Abraham and cause Sarah or Sarai's womb, she was called Sarai at the time, to be able to conceive Isaac as a miracle. So Isaac was born miraculously. Similarly to John the Baptist. John the Baptist's birth is similar to Isaac. Because John the Baptist was conceived to a barren woman, Elizabeth, who could not get pregnant. And his father was old, past the years of childbearing. In other words, he had lost his vigor. So the birth of Isaac is similar to the birth of John the Baptist. Both were born to older couples, older <clears throat> parents, the mothers of whom were barren up to that time. And their fathers were quite old, past the age of childbearing. Right? And so, John the Baptist's birth was miraculous. Isaac's birth was miraculous. And Jesus' birth was miraculous. You can say that John the Baptist's birth was the work of the Holy Spirit. How do I know? Because the Holy Spirit is involved in creating life giving life and sustaining life. And on top of that, it says that John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb, Luke 1, 15. Luke 1, verse 15. Let's see. Let me show you. Luke 1, verse 15. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. So let me ask you a question. You want me to believe that John the Baptist is filled with the Holy Spirit from his conception in the womb of his mother, but he wasn't conceived by the Holy Spirit. How did the Holy Spirit conceive? The Holy Spirit invigorated Zechariah to be able to plant seed and then made the ovum, by his power, conceive a child. So it's still the work of the Holy Spirit. Though two are involved, right, and there's intercourse involved, still it had to be the Holy Spirit 
to then invigorate one and cause the other to take in the seed and conceive. So it's still a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit nonetheless, right? Is that clear? The same would be of Isaac. In fact, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from conception in the womb of his mother. And John in Galatians 4.29 says, Isaac wasn't of the flesh, he was of the spirit. Did you know that? Paul says Ishmael was of the flesh. Isaac was of the spirit. Galatians 4 verse 29. Could the Bible be any clearer or clearer that like Jesus, Isaac's birth was the result of the spirit? Like Jesus, John the Baptist's birth was the result of the Spirit. And Isaac is like Jesus in that, like Jesus, he is the only one said to be the monogenes of his father. Galatians 4.29. But as then he that was born after the flesh, Ishmael, the story is about Ishmael and Isaac, persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Galatians 4.29 is talking about Ishmael. Making fun of Isaac. So it says, the one born after the flesh, according to the will of flesh of man, Ishmael, persecuted him that was born after the spirit. What more proof do you need from the God-breathed scriptures? Isaac and John are like Jesus in that their conceptions and births were the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. And Isaac is a picture of Jesus in that, like Jesus... He is the only son who is the monogenes of his father. Jesus is the only son of God who is God's monogenes. And Isaac is the only son of Abraham who is Abraham's monogenes. Father, we ask in Jesus' name, we come in agreement by the blood of Jesus, the stripes of Jesus, the wounds of Jesus, applied by your spirit, grant serenity, perfect health, and grant everyone who is sick, among us or our family members, perfect healing and health by the blood of Jesus, the stripes of Jesus, the cross of Jesus, apply to our sicknesses and illnesses, ailments, illnesses by your Holy Spirit and keep our loved ones perfectly healthy. My daughter's perfectly healthy. Holy Spirit, take over. And even my words for the glory of Jesus in Jesus' name. She wanted to pray for our sister here. She says she's still sick. Okay, so far are you with me? You guys are with me? Is it making sense? Is it sinking in? You know, in, in, in Jesus' name. And you see how deep the scriptures are, how much meat are in the scriptures, the beauty of scriptures, and why everything is deliberately designed. Nothing there accidentally or coincidentally or by mistake. So now we understood why Isaac is Abraham's monogenes. So let me repeat. Jesus is the only son of God that the Bible calls God's monogenes, that Greek word. Monogenes. Only Jesus is God's monogenes. So now the question is, what makes Jesus God's monogenes? Monogenes. 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 I'm trying to say how a Greek person would say it. Monos genos. What makes Jesus God's monogenes? Because Jesus is the only son of his kind. The other sons of God are not like Jesus. Jesus is unique in his sonship. And what makes him unique? Lots of things. Jesus is the only son of God who is eternal and as old as God. All the other sons came later into being. Jesus is the only son of God who possesses the full essence of God, who possesses every essential attribute that God possesses. No other son possesses the fullness of deity. Only this son does, right? Jesus is the only son of God whom God used to create everything, bring the entire creation into being, and give life to creation and sustain it. And on and on it goes. You want me more? You see? Just knowing who Jesus is will show you why he's called Monogenes, the uniquely born Son of God, the one and only begotten Son of his kind.
God is spirit. What blood does God have? God is spirit by nature. He's not physical. He's not corporeal. What blood does he have? Sort of truth saying, Jesus is the only one who has God's blood. So God the Father has blood? Yes, of course, Jonathan Simon. The term monogenes in reference to Jesus is not about his virginal conception and birth. That's a wrong application. It's referring to his unique sonship. It is a term denoting the unique relationship he enjoys with God as his son. Not the cause or it's not the result of his conception and birth from a virgin. Because if the virginal conception and birth of Jesus is the reason why he's monogamous, how much more Adam, when Adam was produced directly from the dust by God's hands forming him and breathing into him directly into his nostrils, the breath of life without parents, you're setting up for a Muslim objection. Alex Gaskin, you're asking me a question that needs to be nuanced. To take the word monogenes from John and apply it to Matthew isn't wrong if you're trying to look for what makes Jesus unique and you look for Matthew to show his uniqueness, right? Because it's the New Testament witness that will tell us all the ways in Jesus, in all the ways that Jesus is unique and different from every other son, right? You with me there? So is that sinking in? Does everyone understand? The Bible does teach Jesus is the only Son of God. And the Bible does teach that there are other sons of God. Is there a contradiction? No, because Jesus is called the only begotten Son, not because there aren't other sons, but there aren't other sons like him. There is no other son like Jesus. Jesus' sonship is unique, and it's in a category of its own. He's the only son of his kind. He belongs in a unique category that no other son belongs to or fits in. You with me there? I just want to make sure you're getting it. Just like Isaac is Abraham's monogamous, but it doesn't mean Abraham didn't have other sons. It means there is no other son of Abraham like Isaac. Isaac is Abraham's son in a unique way, in a category all on his own. He belongs to a category of sonship in reference to Abraham that no other son fits. I'm giving you a moment to sink in. Now, Protestant believer, the guys in Discord, are they all getting it? Protestant? Folks in Discord, MM, everyone else, they're getting it? Do they have any questions there? What's ding, 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 ding? I don't know what that means. Ding, ding, ding. So, did we thoroughly refute that Muslim meme's suggestion, insinuation, that the church says Jesus is the only Son of God, thereby contradicting what our Lord Jesus says in John 20, 17, that even his followers are sons of God. That we thoroughly refute that pathetic objection. Here's the link to the meme I'll put in the description box. Because now I'm going to end it with the similarities between Isaac and Jesus to help Daily Gripe reinforce what he said. Isaac is a picture of Christ. We'll end it with that. If everyone understood... What it means for our Lord Jesus to be monogamous, the only begotten son, in contrast to the other sons and daughters of God, right? And that there is no problem in affirming both. Yeah, Michael, he wants, I'm sorry, Protestant, Michael wants the link to Discord. He wants a Discord invite. Now, everyone got it. Is anyone confused? If you're confused, let me know. I'm still confused, Sam. Can you help me understand? I don't know what you mean, same. What's same, Alex? 
Nobody confused? Did we thoroughly address John 20, verse 17? And it's misapplication by the Mohammedan meme. No, Williamson. Williamson, were you here from the beginning of the discussion? How can you be monogamous when monogamous refers to someone who's unique? If we're all monogamous, then where's the uniqueness? So, Williamson, why don't you listen from the beginning and not come at the end of a discussion? Because if you were here from the beginning, you would see monogamous refers to someone who's unique in a category of his own. If we're all monogamous, where is the uniqueness? If all of Abraham's sons were monogamous, where is the uniqueness of Isaac in being singled out as monogamous? You with me there? <clears throat> No, it's not so much not chatting. You got to hear all of it before you say something because you don't know if I've already addressed that point. Let me repeat again. <clears throat> Let me repeat again. The term monogamous, as far as our Lord Jesus is concerned, is used for no one else but Jesus. The New Testament, particularly John, clear as day, God has only one monogamous. Not many monogenesis or monogenes, whatever, however you say the plural, right? Only one monogenes, it's Jesus Christ. Jesus alone is God's monogenes, okay? Just like Isaac alone is Abraham's monogenes. And that doesn't mean no other children. There is no other child of Abraham, who is like Isaac, which is why Isaac alone is Abraham's monogenes. There is no other son, child, daughter, and any other spiritual offspring of God who is like Jesus, which is why Jesus alone is God's monogenes. Monogenes. Right? Did it sink in? I don't mind repeating. I know some people get tortured, but the more I repeat, that will enable us to better understand and absorb by the power of the Holy Spirit. So now we can teach others these glorious truths for the glory of Jesus. Right? Making sense? If it's making sense, I can now go out with a treat. How Isaac is a picture of Christ. Okay? Let's talk about Isaac being a picture of Christ, and we'll end this session, and Lord willing, we'll continue in the days to come. Just pray for me, folks. Today's a little hard on me, just emotionally a little drained. I have to sign the lease to move into the new place by February 15, and I'm trusting the gracious provision of our Lord for the financial needs to get settled on my feet, to do this work for the Lord, and be able to take care of myself and my daughter. So pray for just miraculous provisions that the Lord will show me he's with me and my daughters because they'll never leave nor forsake us. It gets tiring. You guys know, those of you with children, it gets tiring to be somewhere else far away from your kids and not seeing them. I can't wait for Jesus to take me home or for him to come to the earth and that I'm clothed in his righteousness and washed in his blood so I can stand worthy of our Lord. This world sucks. This world sucks. But until Jesus calls me home, pray I can get healthier, lose more weight, and be holier for the Lord. Okay, anyway, let's finish it. The first similarity between our Lord Jesus Christ and Isaac, we already saw it. We hammered it over and over and over again. Jesus and Isaac are called monogenes. Write down the references. Isaac is called Abraham's monogenes in Hebrews eleven seventeen. Right? Hebrews eleven seventeen. 17, Isaac is said to be Abraham's monogenes. Our Lord Jesus is said to be God the Father's monogenes. And where is he called the Father's monogenes? Write these down. Five times in John's letters. Four times in the Gospel of John. One time in the first letter of John. 
Five times monogenes is applied to our glorious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because he alone is the Father's monogenes. John 1, verse 14. John 1, verse 18. John 3, verse 16. John 3, verse 18. Four times in the Gospel of John. John 1, 14. John 1, 18. John 3, verses 16 and 18. And then 1 John, chapter 4, verse 9. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. So that's one similarity. Isaac, like Jesus, is his father's monogenes. Isaac is Abraham's monogenes. Jesus is God the Father's monogenes. All right. Now let's go to Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2. We're going to have some fun if you're up for it. If you want to go out with a bang, pray that by the end of the month, we get about 500 people listening to me live. Yeah. Please, Lord, do it for your glory. Hallelujah. A lot of meat today, man. A lot of meat today. In Jesus' name. There was a lot of meat today, right? May bless the internet connection. We got a lot of meat. We even talked about church structure, church discipline, church authority. Lots of meat. I love meats. For Bray, I don't gain weight. I lose. Don't hate. Man, these shoulders are too narrow. See the bicep here? It's, it's, it's like flat. It's getting, it's getting there. Where is the love? It's getting there. All right, all right. Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2. In Jesus' name. Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2. Watch here. Let's look at it again. Where is the love? And it came to pass after three things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I, here I am. Now watch. And said, And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. And get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. So Isaac is not just the one and only son of Abraham, Hebrew Yachid, Yachid. Some pronounce it Yachid, Yachid, contrast to Ichad, okay, Yachid. He's also the son he loves. So like Jesus, Isaac is considered the one and only son, Managanes. Isaac is the monogenes of Abraham. Jesus is the monogenes of God the Father. And like Jesus, Isaac is his father's beloved son, the son that the father loves, without implying that the father doesn't love the other children. He's Abraham's beloved. And Jesus is God's beloved. Let's look at it. You ready? Are you ready for the proof? Mark 111. Mark 111. Let me know if this is boring, you guys. Mark 1, verse 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Thou art my beloved son, the son whom I love, in whom I am well pleased. That's Mark 1, 11. All right. John 3, 35. John 3, 35. John 3, 35. Thank the triune God, Marcy, and pray the triune God sanctifies me, purifies me, and fills me for the glory of Jesus and my daughters, my angels. John 3, 35. The Father loveth the Son. This is inspired witness of John. And hath given all things into his hand. So John affirms Jesus is the Father's monogenes and the one he loves. John 5, 20. What does our Lord Jesus say? John 5, verse 20. John 5, verse 20. A lot of meat in the word, isn't there? For the Father, this is Jesus our Lord speaking. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. So Jesus says, the Father loves the Son, me. And from how long ago has the Father been loving the Son? From how long ago has the Father been loving the Son? John 17, verse 24. Jesus in his high priestly prayer to the Father. And the reason why it's called the high priestly prayer. prayer, Right? John 17, verse 24. I'll explain that later. Not today. John 17, verse 24. Father, I will they that also whom thou hast given me be with me, with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given, given me, 
For thou lovest me, you have loved me before the foundation of the world. I am the one you have been loving even before the world was created. Hmm. Interesting. Ephesians 1 verse 6. And we'll read 7. Ephesians 1, 6 to 7. 6 and 7, but Ephesians 1, 6 to 7. Yep. I love to crack my neck. Sorry, guys. Ooh, stiff. I need a good chiropractor. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he, God the Father, had made us accepted in the beloved. He's accepted us in union with his beloved for the sake of his beloved, in whom, because of the beloved, we have redemption through his blood, the blood of the beloved, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. And the word there translated as dear son, is the word love, dear son. Colossians 1, 13 to 14. Conversion table? Yeah, I need that. I need my spine to be cracked in place. Okay, let me show you. I'm going to get you the Greek here. Okay, let's, let's read. Who had delivered us from the power of darkness and had translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, here's the interlinear for the word dear. If you see, those of you who know Greek, you can read the Greek. Even if you can't read Greek, it's transliterated. If you go there, the Greek, BibleHub.com, an excellent resource free of charge. He's called, it's a kingdom of two, uh, we you, two, we you, teis, agapes, au tu. Tase agapes. Agapes is where we get the word agape, agape love. The son of him, the beloved of him, the beloved son, the son whom he loves. So you see the similarities? Both Isaac and Jesus are the mon monogamous of their respective fathers. Both Isaac and Jesus are the beloved sons of their respective fathers, right? Do you see that? So far, he's seeing similarity, right? Now, let's go to Genesis 22 and read 3 to 5. Genesis 22, verses 3 to 5. Now, it may not come out in your translation. I think the New King James brings it out. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and claved the wood for the burnt offering, notice what day he arrives to the desig designated spot. Notice what day he arrives to the designated spot, right? Claved the word for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Notice four. Then on the third day, he arrived at the designated spot on the third day. He arrived on the designated spot on the third day. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. But here's what gets amazing in verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here, you stay here with the ass, don't come with us. And I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now, here's what you don't see in the English. Come again unto you, come again to you is plural. I and the lad are going to worship, and we will come again to you. We, him and I, will come back. That's what the Hebrew says. Now, look at the King James in verse 5. I think the King, New King James. The New King James brings out the Hebrew. The New King James. We will come back. Watch here. We will come back. He's going to bring the New King James in so he can make the point. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder worship, and we will come back to you. The boy and I, we together will return. Wait, Abraham, you know the boy is as good as dead. You're about to kill him as a sacrifice. Why did you tell your servants you're going to come back with the lad? Both of you are going to come back. Because understand what Abraham is thinking. God, who has proven himself faithful, 
He told me Sarah will have a son, and she had a son. He told me that son will be the heir of the covenant. And through his seed, he's going to have children. That's going to make Sarah a mother of many nations. But now God is telling me to kill this son, and he has no children. Work with me, folks. Work with me. How Abraham's reasoning. Genesis 17, we read, God said, Sarah will have a son. She'll be the mother of nations, and kings of peoples will come from her. She's going to have a son who's going to have descendants so nu numerous. Her son is going to be the ancestor of so many human lives, making his mother the mother of many people, many nations. But wait, God, I'm about to kill Isaac. He has no sons. But you promised me this is the son who will be the heir of the covenant. And you said my descendants will be numbered through his line. It's his descendants, his seed, that will inherit the blessings of the covenant. And it's through Isaac that he's going to make his mother a mother of nations. But he has no children. And so far, everything you've promised, you have done. But now you're going to have me kill the lad. What about the promise that he's going to make his mother the mother of many nations and that his offspring will be the heirs of my covenant? What about that promise, God? I know the kind of God you are. You cannot lie. You don't go back on your word. You've proven faithful over and over again. But then how are you going to have me kill him? You haven't kept your promise regarding him. Oh, it's a test. Whether I'll do it, and if I do, God will then raise him from the dead and restore him to me because he's the God of life and he can do that. You understand what Abraham's reasoning? You understand his reasoning? That's why he said, we will come back. That was a statement of faith. A statement of faith saying, look, I can't understand why God is doing this to my son. And why is he having me do to my son? I don't understand your wisdom, your ways, but I've come to know the God that you are. You're a faithful God. You're a good God, a loving God. And you've been good to me. You've been my friend and you've never lied to me. I can't understand why you're allowing this to happen and why are you doing this? But I will not lose hope. I will trust in you. And I know how good you are, how good you've been to me. You will raise him back to life because you're that kind of God who keeps his promises. See, I'm, my, the hairs on my hands are standing. That's supposed to be a lesson for us. And it's a lesson for me. For two years, God, I've been left homeless. For over two years, I haven't been able to put my daughters to sleep like I used to, that they got accustomed to, and wake up to them, and take them to school, and pick them up, and love bomb them, and affirm them, and hold them for two years. And I haven't even seen them face to face since June. And I haven't heard their voice since, since September. And I got a corrupt, evil, wicked judge, a whore of Satan. Trying to destroy me. And there are other men in the lives of my children. And I'm lonely. In a different state from the one I was raised. I don't understand why this is happening. And what good will come out of it. And what the end will be. But this I know. This I know. You're the God of Abraham. And you're the friend of Abraham. And you're a faithful God. And you're a good God. And you're a beautiful God. And a loving God. And I know you love me. And are in love with me. And in love with my daughters. And I know, I know, I know from my heart. You will never abandon me. But you'll preserve me for your glory. And because of that, though you slay me, I will trust in you. I will believe in you. I will love you. And ask the Spirit to help me to fall more in love with you. You are <clears throat> my God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So don't just read this as a story. Don't just read this as a story. Read it as history and as an example of God's faithfulness to you. The God of Abraham is your God. The friend of Abraham is your friend. 
And the faithful God of Abraham is your faithful God. Right? Clear? So I just want you to understand how Abraham's reasoning. So he wasn't lying. He reasoned that though I will kill him, God, who's the God of life, will resurrect him again because he will not break his promise concerning Isaac. That I know for sure. He will not lie. He cannot lie. He will not break his promise. Now, Genesis 22, verses 4 and 5. Genesis 22, verses 4 and 5. Amen. In Jesus' name, Alex, may he hear you and grant us the faith of Abraham. Now let me show you, let me show you what Hebrews saw by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Pay attention. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place so far off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and we will come again to you. What day was this? Third day. When was Isaac going to come back to them? Third day. He was going to come back to them third day. Now let's see the reasoning of Hebrews. Hebrews 11, verses 17 to 19. Daily gripe, I hope you're paying attention because this is how you make the connections. And the Lord bless you for his glory and use you. And everyone here. By faith... Abraham, when he was tried, <clears throat> offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises, see, promises. See, keep that in mind. The author of Hebrews is reminding you. Remember the promises about Isaac? He that received the promises, meaning about Isaac and Isaac's offsprings, offspring being the <clears throat> seed of the covenant, those promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. You see the reasoning of Hebrews as the Holy Spirit is illuminating him? He's making these connections. Oh, I see. But now notice 19. Accounting, he considered that God was able to raise him up, raise Isaac up, even from the dead. From whence also he received him in a figure. And he did receive him back from the dead, figuratively speaking, because as far as Abraham was concerned, he was good as dead. So when did Abraham receive Isaac Back from the dead, figuratively speaking, on the third day. On the third day. So Isaac was raised figuratively, symbolically, back to life on the third day. Abraham's monogamous, his beloved, was raised back to life on the third day, figuratively, symbolically, and God's monogamous. His beloved was raised back to life physically, actually, on the third day. You got it? Is it making sense? Other connections with Jesus so we can finish. Genesis 22, verse 6. And verse 9. Genesis 22, verse 6 and 9. Skip 7 and 8. Go to Genesis 22, 6 and 9. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac. So who carried the wood upon which Isaac would be sacrificed? Isaac carried the wood. The wood which would be the instrument of his sacrifice. He carried his wood upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told them of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him up on the altar upon the wood. Isaac carried the wood that be, would be used to pretty much crucify him. John 19, 17. John 19, 17. John 19, 17. And he bearing his cross, like Isaac, Jesus carried the wood of his <clears throat> crucifixion, the instrument of his death, the wood of his death. Went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. So like Jesus, Isaac carried the instrument of his death, the wood, the cross. Right? Let's read 7 and 8. Genesis 22, 7 and 8, and then we're going to skip to 13. 
Genesis 22, 7 and 8. We're almost done, folks. Watch here. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. So Abraham is not lying. I know God will provide a lamb for the burnt offering. That I know, my son. So just trust God. But now when we skip to 13, pay attention. Skip to 13, let's read. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, be behind him a ram, he looked, a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. So he offered him in the place of Isaac as Isaac's substitute. He died in the place of Isaac so Isaac could be spared. Number one, a ram is not a lamb. A ram is not a lamb. That means the lamb wasn't given yet. It was still to be given. Number two, a thicket is a thorn bush. So the ram's horns, its head was caught in a thorn bush. Sound familiar? They placed a crown of thorns on the head of Jesus. And the ram died in the place of Isaac as Isaac's substitute so that Isaac wouldn't die. A ram died in his place so he wouldn't die like Jesus died in our place, in our stead, so that we don't die. Yet, it's still not the lamb. Why? Because Genesis 22, 14 tells you the lamb was yet to come. Genesis 22, verse 14. Read here. Genesis 22, verse 14. Okay. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. That's where we get the word Jehovah Jireh. We get it from here because he called the mountain where he's going to crucify or sacrifice Isaac. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah provides. Yahweh, Yehovah, Yira. Right? As it is said to this day, in the mount of Jehovah it shall be seen. So he's saying, this mount in the future, we will see what God has in store. So where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? John 1, 29. He comes 2,000 years later. Here is the lamb that Abraham told Isaac will be provided for you, my son. John 1, 29. Here is the lamb, my son Isaac. He's coming. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Isaac, my son, there he is. That's the Lamb of God. Like you, he is God's monogamous. You are my monogamous. He is God's monogamous. Like you, you're my beloved. He is God's beloved. Like you, were given back to me. From the dead, figuratively speaking, on a third day, because I thought you're as good as dead. God will receive His beloved back to Himself from the day, from the uh, from the dead. God will receive him from the dead on the third day, because Isaac, my son, you and I are a picture of the Father's love and the love of His Son for humanity. What we are, they happen to be but in a greater, more profound manner. We are nothing but shadows of that great reality, my son. You are a picture of our Savior to come, the Father's beloved. You see? And what's beautiful, when Abraham offered Isaac, was he offering something of inferior value or was he offering something of equal value to himself, of equal dignity to himself, of equal worth to himself? Because Isaac is fully human like Abraham, and being the co-heir of the covenant, he's just as valuable, just as important, right? And has just as much worth as Abraham does. As a picture that when Father gave, gave Jesus, the Father wasn't giving something infinitely less than him. 
like Abraham gave something equal to him in essence, the father gave the world also that one who is equal to him in essence, in glory, in nature, in value, in worth. Because the Lamb of God is just as much God as the Father is. Right? This is the greatest love story ever told. When you get a chance, go to YouTube and look for the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. I can't play it because if I play it, it's going to get flagged, my video. Copyright, copyright. Look for the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. With that said, I hope you're blessed overabundantly. Pray God will use my meager efforts. Bless the YouTube channel, my YouTube channel. Bless it to take off, to bring in more viewers, sub subscribers, to learn how to navigate YouTube, to produce, produce better quality videos, to loosen my tongue, to speak clearly and truthfully, always for the glory of Christ. Pray for my daughters and I, for our health, for our provision, for a blessing of overabundant provisions for the next two months to sustain me if he wants me to do ministry. And pray that the Lord will help us to become holier, more like Jesus, more in love with him, know the word more deeply and live it more powerfully by the life and power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that the Lord will continue to use me to bless you as you've been a blessing to me and forgive me for my shortcomings. And I pray I never cause you to fall away, but to strengthen you by the Holy Spirit using me for the glory of Jesus. I'm your servant for the sake of Christ and I love you for his sake. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come Lord Jesus, we love you. Take care.